being. So here's a kind of a funny metaphor. Imagine that your mind, everybody's mind, is like a pond. That's kind of a traditional metaphor, except this pond is bubbly. It's effervescent. And if we were to really slow it down, we would recognize that there's the surface of the pond. And all over the surface of the pond, and let's imagine that that surface is bare awareness, the most basic, most elemental sense of the um, er emergent, the emergence of this current instant of consciousness, of experiencing. That's the surface of the pond. And then at that surface, all these kind of bubbles arise. They come to the surface, they sort of gather, and then if they can solidify in some ways, boop, they lift off from the surface, we carrying us with them. A normal process, little preoccupation, like next week, well, should I participate? Should I go see Tarane? Rick won't be here. Maybe someone else would be a welcome change. All these, oh, how dare I have those thoughts? Whatever, you know, thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. It's a normal process in which our reactions to things, our thoughts, our feelings, our wants, little fantasies solidify, and then we get identified with them. There's a sense of I or me in these little bubbles, and off we go. Sometimes we find ourselves being carried away, including drawing on the sort of ruminative processes supported by the so-called default mode network in the rearward midline of the brain. We get carried away for quite a ways, right? You find yourself just thinking about something and that leads to the next thing, which leads to the next. In particular, we tend to get carried away with negative reactions of one kind or another, resentments, about various people, or worries, or a sense of remorse even, uh, maybe fantasies of different kinds, pleasurable fantasies, painful fantasies, swept away. And this process of what's called in Pali, papancha, mental proliferation, is a major, major structural feature of suffering, dukkha in the traditional word in the early language of the Buddha, dukkha. So uh, if we are to suffer less and to rest increasingly in a basic sense of well-being that's engaged with the world prior to those bubbles solidifying and selfifying and carrying us away, it's very useful to be able to increasingly rest as close as we can to the surface of the pond. As experiences are occurring, sensations are occurring, thoughts are occurring, sounds are occurring, but we're not solidifying them. We're not being carried away by them. And I wanna emphasize the word solidifying or essentializing, reifying, thingifying. Um, one of the penetrating insights of the Buddha, one of his most fundamental liberating insights was into the inherent emptiness of all experiences. Experiences are occurring. They are happening. There is hearing. There is seeing. There is wanting. There is remembering. There is planning. But when you look closely, the actual nature of those experiences is always transient, dynamic, changing, impermanent. It's always compounded. There are different elements in them, kind of buzzing and quivering away. And all experiences arise dependently. They don't have any absolute existence on their own. They lack substance or even, in some sense, an, an identity. They're empty of absolute self-existing solidity. And yet the brain automatically to help us and our primate ancestors live to see the sunrise, the brain routinely invents a kind of solidity or unification or stability to experiences. 
It's like, you know, the image of a banana. It's cognitively efficient to just go, oh, a thing, done, <laughs> banana, <laughs> right? Yellow, smells good, tastes good, needs to be riper, too green, whatever, you know, banana. And that's very efficient. It's also very efficient when it gets applied to yourself, uh, whatever your name is, Rick. Suddenly, Rick is a solid entity of some kind, when in fact, my experience of Rick is a real mess. <laughs> it's very fuzzy and insubstantial and continually changing. And I bet your experience of yourself, by whatever name, uh, is much the same. So the actual nature of our experiences is that they're dynamic, they're fuzzy, they're insubstantial, they come, they go, they blur into each other. They're cloud-like, not brick-like. And yet we routinely, habitually thingify them, brickify them, which then makes it a lot easier to get caught up in suffering about them to try to resist certain kinds of experiences or to hold on to others, to identify with them, to make them ourselves, to act like we own them. This is a fundamental, fundamental classic teaching. And one of the ways to deal with it that's really, really useful is to become more and more mindful in real time of this process of papancha, of mental proliferation, of the swamp gas bubbling up in the inner pond and then gathering form, becoming kind of encrusted with other reactions and carrying you away. The closer we come to the immediacy of this sensation, this sound, this thought, the more we stay really close to the emergent the emergent moment of experience in the present, the more we're resting in simply being. We're being the whole surface of the pond with a growing intuition of being the pond altogether. And in that whew, is immediate <laughs> relief from contraction and pressure and reactivity. By the way, I'll be taking a look at some of your comments in the chat is, and taking them into account as I go along. So I want to read a couple of quotations uh, from uh, the chapter on the practice of wholeness, which is very related to what I'm talking about in my recent book, uh, Neurodharma. The opening quotation from Wu Men Huikai is, flowers in springtime, moon in autumn, cool wind in summer, snow in winter. If you don't make anything in your mind, for you, it is a good season. We're continually fabricating, making things in the mind. And when we stop fabricating, when we allow the process to unfold, but without chasing after mental proliferations and without thingifying them, essentializing them. In other words, if we stay close to kind of the ground of being, while recognizing in, as Rob Burbay puts it in the title of his stunning book, seeing that freeze, as we continue to recognize whatever's bubbling into a, uh, awareness as inherently empty, existing emptily, oof, we become much freer in our relationship to it, much more at ease. So I wanna talk now about very practical ways to rest more in an underlying, increasingly ongoing sense of being. We explored some of that in the meditation, and you may wanna go back to that meditation, which is recorded, and um, listen to it um, and practice with it again and again. So first, when we feel like our needs are unmet significantly in the moment, if we're 
gripped with a sense of not feeling safe enough or satisfied enough or connected enough, well, then, understandably, we get carried away in our reactions. It's hard to rest in a sense of, of a kind of peacefulness of simply being. So, to the extent we can, we try to address external conditions that are threatening or frustrating or isolating, and we do what we can in terms of trying to intervene in the outer world, including in our relationships, to meet our needs. So there's less basis for any kind of um, sense of something missing or something wrong that drives craving, which leads to suffering. Okay. Also, we try to develop, it's helpful to develop inner strengths of different kinds so that you can actually meet your needs more effectively. There's no replacement for effective action uh, based on growing inner strengths like grit or calm or a sense, a capacity to relax the body, to meet your needs for safety, uh, making good plans that are effective in helping yourself be as safe as you can be, and also developing inner resources to meet your needs for satisfaction and connection. That's a useful thing to do, really good to do. I've written a lot about it, about how to take in the good, to hardwire these inner strengths, these inner resources into your own nervous system. Also, really helps when it's authentically available, which actually it is much of the time, to feel safe enough, satisfied enough, connected enough in the present so that you can afford to rest in a felt sense of calm strength and peacefulness, thankfulness and contentment, a sense of open-heartedness, kindness, feeling cared about by others, resting in that. And as you rest in this, then contraction and agitation that chases after those little swamp gas balloons emerging in consciousness falls away, really falls away. That's really useful. And you saw me deliberately move through and kind of prime you and prime your brain and body to feel at least in the present, to the extent that's possible, in a, a settledness in the core of your being. Swirling around that could well be worries and loneliness, anger, and in the core of your being, way down deep, can be a settledness and ease that, op that is an opening into simply being, undisturbed, undefended, open-hearted, contented peacefulness. That's very good. Also, pathway into simply being, and by the way, these pathways are real. They work, they're certainly not contradicted by any significant science, they're supported, of the science that is actually available, I commend them to you. <laughs> they're, they're good, they're good vehicles. All right, so one more is, and also for good neurological reasons, as we open into the sense of things as a whole, the sense of the body as a whole, the room as a whole, the mind as a whole, we get a growing sense of spaciousness. Maybe we do practices where we just look up at the sky or imagine the heavens stretching in all directions around us, above, below, and beyond. As we do that, that too relaxes contractions, relaxes um, the thingifying and, and um, partitioning of consciousness, the sense of being divided internally. So we go into a sense of spaciousness, that sense of being divided and identified with whatever reaction uh, is proliferating in our own minds, that sense diminishes dramatically as we go into spaciousness. Practices of spaciousness are really useful. The body as a whole, the mind as a whole, imagining spaciousness, lifting your gaze spaciously, 
a sense of space, awareness of the space between the thought balloons bubbling up. A sense of the grout, the space between the thoughts that are occurring. That's really, really useful. Also, another um, major thing that's helpful here is to get more and more of an intuition of sort of, I think of it as like the idling rate of the brain. You, you can kind of get a sense as your mind quiets, you as you rest in, in being, that there's this, this sort of ongoing, kind of like the refrigerator humming in the background, a kind of an ongoing, you know, just basic metabolic activity, you know, in the nervous system. When, the, when your mind is really quiet, your brain is still metabolizing oxygen and glucose and, you know, neurons are firing and wiring and neurochemicals are ebbing and flowing. And it's, it's still alive, but it's not necessarily um, representing very much the brain. It's just sort of humming away. I think of it as fertile noise, just ready to represent something, ready to get caught up in the next proliferating thought bubble, next reaction cascade. It's ready, but it's not yet there. And you can have more and more of a sense of just sort of resting in the basic metabolic idling of your own nervous system. It's a little bit like getting a sense of your, your heart rate slowing and your respiration, your breathing slowing too, as your body quiets. Just there. I'm not trying to organize anything or grasp after anything. Just there. Just this in the present. Okay. All right, so I have another little quote to share with you. As you deepen in this sense of simply being, because that's what we are, when we're not, when you're not chasing anything, when you're not resisting anything, when you're not identifying with anything, when you're not trying to be someone, who are you? You in the broadest sense. You may know the classic Bahia Sutta in Buddhism, uh, in which to summarize the whole sutta, the Buddha advised someone named Bahia that he should practice thus. In the seeing, let there be just the seeing. In the hearing, let there be only the hearing. In the thinking, only the thinking. And when we do that, there's very little, if any, sense of self. And when we're in the ground state of simply letting seeing be seeing without adding anything to it, hearing, be hearing without adding anything to it, when we're just really present in that way, that, just that, is the end of all suffering, as the Buddha said. And as we deepen in this sense of, you know, just being able to be, as we, get, as we return, it's like a homecoming. If, if the surface of the pond is our fundamental home, and as we return to abiding as that surface and in the immediacy of the present, as it is, the suchness of the present, without adding anything to it, without fabricating or proliferating from it, as we come home to that, we really feel that we're at home. This is our resting state. This is the ground condition. And we can feel it. And with training, with practice, you can get a sense of it that you carry with you increasingly wherever you go. 
and you're more able to return to it ever more rapidly. And it can be, it may be, that as we rest in simply being, increasingly bare, increasingly unfabricated, as we rest there, we begin maybe to have an intuition that this quality of individual being, the body-mind, simply being, we may begin to have an intuition that simply being as the body-mind in some way opens into, partakes of some kind of mysterious, vaster sense of being vaster sense of awareness. And I say this not to assert necessarily the existence of that, but simply to name uh, a real experience that, that many people have. And teachers like Adya Shanti speak about very clearly. This is a quotation from Adya Shanti, from Adya. An attitude of open receptivity free of any goal or anticipation, will facilitate the presence of silence and stillness to be revealed as your natural condition. Awareness naturally returns to its non-state of absolute unmanifest potential, the silent abyss beyond all knowing. Anjashanti has gone a very long way it's gone farther than I have. Uh, I'll read it again. An attitude of open receptivity, free of any goal or anticipation, will facilitate the presence of silence and stillness to be revealed as your natural condition. Awareness naturally returns to its non-state of absolute un unmanifest potential, the silent abyss beyond all knowing. To simply feel it without needing to understand it necessarily and feeling drawn in the direction that Adyashanti is pointing to and inviting us onward into. Simply being. Being you most fully unfolding in the present. Without hindrance, without inner division, without fabrication. Ah. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> so let's see what kind of questions have come in or comments. I think Elaine, I just saw this right now at 7 or 9 p.m. Um, one of the hardest things to do is nothing extra. You're exactly right. And what happens when you start to engage this practice is you catch yourself again and again, carried away carried away, hopping on board, right? These bubbles coming up out of the pond of being. And <clears throat> okay, it's all right, it's all right. And sometimes I think you just gotta do it. You just gotta hop on board. You gotta really think about a problem. Um, I'm working on a piece of text now. And, you know, <laughs> the hardest thing to write is a short paragraph. <laughs> That's got to really get the job done. So sometimes you have to do that, or you're or you're deeply engaged. Let's say, as someone has written me earlier, uh, with the care of an aging parent who's probably, you know, um, toward the end of their life. Okay, you got to do it. Maybe you have to put out a fire, but when you can, like during meditation, or maybe at a moment of mindfulness while simply doing the dishes, seeing what it's like for there to be. As the Buddha advised Bahia, there in the in the washing, let there be merely the washing or only the washing. In the touching of the water, can there be just the touching of the water? Can there be a also as Rob Burbet talks about it, can there be a seeing or a recognizing, a knowing of of the experience of water on your hands as as empty, as not solid and thingified, but cloud-like and dynamic and changing. And as we train in this way, our capacity to locate at least way down deep as a kind of inner sanctuary 
Well, way up here, we're dealing with the madness. Way down deep, that sense of being, as we train in the ways I've described, we become more able to rest and return to or be and stay in touch with that sense of beingness. All right. So let's see. Thanks, Elaine. I need a good editor. Um, well, this is great. So I'll, let's use Jack's comment here at 7.14 p.m. as a good sort of example. Jack writes, what is a good way to deal with a persistent inner voice that says, prove yourself? Okay. So I too have such an inner voice or versions of it other people may have too, a kind of a critic. So here's the thing. What's the seeing of that inner voice, building on how Rob would put it, no longer with us anymore, unfortunately, and may his memory be a blessing, uh, Rob Burbay, the book, Seeing That Freeze. So what's a way to see, to recognize that inner voice that's, that starts to unpack it and begins to recognize its emptiness rather than its solidity? Can we be mindful of the ways that we relate to these inner voices or perspectives as if they're solid, as if the case they're making or the points they're making are solid and weighty and implicate us in some way or bombard us in some way? But when you look more closely at that voice, you see that it has different aspects. They're different points of view in it, there are different tones, you know, there are different body sensations associated with it, there are different emotions associated with it, there are different underlying attitudes or views associated with it. It's complicated. It's airy. It's it's got a lot of threads to it. It's not solid and brick like. That's very, very useful. Recognizing it's emptiness and in a way that tends to free us, airs it out. We may not get a perfect release, takes repetition often, but we can sure feel less burdened by it, for example. Or also, proof. What is proving? The inner voice that says, prove yourself. So here too, we can recognize or see proving in ways that free us. We can, what is proving? We tend to relate to proving as if it's a solid thing, like, oh, I know what that's like in my body, that as a thing. And yet if we engage it, we, if we, we're mindful of it and we kind of slow it down and we unpack it, whoa, proving starts to feel airier as well, emptier as well, less burdensome. We don't feel so demanded by it. Solid things of one kind or another, or solid or high pressure forces that come at us, yeah, those demand of us. But wait a minute here. If we can recognize, if we can regard those forces that prove yourself as fuzzy, empty, cloudy, we're less pushed around by them. Instant, instant reduction, at least, of the pressure the contra and the contraction against that force coming at us. Also, here's a big one, yourself. What is yourself? <laughs> this is not pedantic. This is not intellectual. This is not like some class in freshman philosophy somewhere. This is looking directly at your own experience and the assumptions that are embedded so much in our experiences. This presumption yourself as some entity or thing. Well, what do you mean yourself? Like, huh? <laughs> Prove yourself? Well, wait a minute here. There are many selves, there are many me's. Mini me's and mega me's, right? Maga me's, I don't know about that. But anyway, so many me's. 
so many parts, so many thoughts, so many attitudes, so much history. What about the self you were yesterday or will be tomorrow? Ugh. You see, this deconstructing, you know, when you take it apart, it's a lot looser and a lot easier. And when you do that, it's really interesting too. You can start to get closer and closer to the immediacy of your experience just before that inner critic congeals, solidifies, and then starts yelling at you. And if you come back to what were you feeling before it got all crystallized, maybe uh, just sensations in your body related to a little sense of inadequacy or a longing for approval or closeness. And the closer you get, like the Buddha advised Bahia, to the direct raw experience, the primacy of immediate raw experience, the closer you get, direct correlation, the less suffering there is. There may still be pain. There may still be what the Buddha called the first darts of sorrow over losing a parent or outrage over things happening in your country or uh, you know, a physical pain in your body or um, a health concern of some kind. Yeah, there may still be that. But the closer you get to the direct, immediate primacy of raw experience, you can just observe directly less selfing, less solidifying, less suffering. Yeah, true, again and again and again. Okay. Um, so Amelia, um, at 7.20 p.m., asks a really important question. And by the way, I think I'm just going to deal with questions in the chat. Um, what I'm talking about here can kind of seem abstract, and I, I want to keep bringing it down to your own direct experience. So Amelia asks a very important question. What if one of the factors I talked about of being able to come home and, and sort of feel at rest rather than agitated uh, or divided um, is a basic sense of enoughness and all rightness? So Amelia asks, what if the feeling of enoughness and basic all rightness is not accessible to you? That is not my resting state and never has been. My core does not feel very peaceful. How can we find that home? I worry that way down deep there is nothing. Very real. So I want to be clear. Um, I'm, sp I'm speaking from a relatively fortunate life that has included, especially in my earlier years, uh, just a lot of unhappiness, contraction, just misery and feeling horrible about myself. Um, but I have not been traumatized, I think. I wouldn't use that word for my history. I, I got kind of lucky in my genetics. So I want to acknowledge all that. And it, it really is true that uh, some people, um, you know, they're just there's there's more of an internal sense of disturbance, dysregulation, uneasiness. It's just kind of innate, potentially, and then also certainly um, many people, often including people who have that underlying kind of, you know, buzzing in their physiology. Even uh, then, ba boom, life lands on them really hard, and then woof, here we are now today. So acknowledging all that. What I would suggest is that to find simple experiences that are undeniably um, rewarding, reassuring, comforting, okay. So the experience, literally, of drinking a little water when your throat is a little raw and you're a little thirsty. Taking a little breath when you're you know, wanting to breathe a little more deeply. Putting on a little sweater if you're getting a bit chilled. These kinds of things. The immediacy of feeling the fur of your cat. 
in that moment, when you come really close to that experience, in that experience, it is enough. It feels there's a basic sense of okayness in that experience. Around the edges, there may be chronic anxiety or physical pain, irritation, sorrow, okay? But we can find these experiences in which the body has a basic feeling of all rightness in that moment, in that experience. It really is true. It's absolutely true. And also, there can be an awareness of the kind of idling of the body, like a car's engine is just turning over. The heart is continuing to beat. Breathing is occurring. The basic processes of consciousness are still going fine. They're still going. There is awareness. There is thinking. There is remembering. It's really ongoing. And so by drawing attention to that basic ongoingness, basic functioning, you really can again and again fight your way to a sense of sanctuary, a sense of basic all rightness. And then it's important when you're having that experience, as you drink the water or take the breath, slow down and highlight that experience because it's such a refuge for you. And having those kind of experiences 20 times a day, I mean, seriously, Amelia and others, 20 times a day, two, three, four, five, ten 10 seconds at a time, 20 times a day, basic all rightness, basic ongoingness, here, alive, okay. Then you gradually build that out. You build out from there. You get more established in that. It becomes a basis for you. Really, really important. So we, we can all do that. We can all really do that. It, it's not hopeless. And also, way down deep in everyone is good intentions. There may be other intentions floating around. My own view is that at bottom, all underneath all bad intentions are some kind of good intention pursued in problematic ways. Uh, it's a personal view. See for yourself if you think it's true. But way down deep in... Amelia and, and everybody is a fundamental quality of a movement to be helpful, to construct rather than destroy, even if there are aggressive feelings understandably alongside it. That's way down deep in all of us, way down deep. You, you know that in yourself. And I think part of the process here is to take a stand for, for that as the deep truth of yourself. You know? Deep down, you and I are a good person. And there's no replacement for each individual taking a stand in that conviction. Nobody else can do that for you. At the end of the day, we have to help ourselves to believe it. And you may start out, as I have, that like 1% of you believes it, maybe one-tenth of 1%. The rest is like, what are you talking about? But you, you kind of hold on to what you know is true. And then you build it out, you build it out, and increasingly you know, yeah, deep down inside, there's goodness there. It may be covered over. In my case, certainly there have been other impulses and reactions and contractions that have swept me away, even for years at a time with important people in my life. Um, and yet still, alongside all that and underneath all that is a fundamental inherent goodness without needing to be special or super duper or saintly. Just you, everybody, you know, <laughs> the schlub walking next to you on the street and they look at you and think, what was that schlub walking next to me? You know, <laughs> That schlub walking next to you is a good person way down deep. And by down deep, I don't mean covered over and hidden and just innately, an innately good person. You are innately good. And we have to take a stand for that. Okay. So let's see, a couple minutes. <clears throat> okay. 
So I want to summarize a couple, a few things here, and then maybe we'll just sit for a minute and let it sink in. Um, the ground state that is always the case and available for mindful, we can be mindfully aware of it without any mumbo jumbo or hardcore spiritual practice, just the resting state has qualities of being. We're simply being. And there are experiences occurring in the present as we be. And as we stay close to the immediacy of experiences as they are occurring in the present, that disrupts the habits of proliferation, of fabrication, of papancha, which is the structural basis <clears throat> for so much of our suffering. We don't get carried away in our mental reaction cascades as we stay close to the feeling of being, simply being. Being all of who we are, sorrow included, fear included, thoughts of me included, all of it, but really close to the present before a lot of proliferation can occur and hijack us away. That's very possible for us and very, very, very useful. Supportive factors are to help yourself have a sense of a basic enoughness and to cultivate an underlying, increasingly unconditional sense of open-hearted, contented peacefulness. That's a factor of resting in being. Um, a sense of spaciousness, uh, wholeness, your body as a whole, awareness as a whole, room as a whole, spaciousness opening without bounds in all directions, that's a good factor. And with practice, as your mind and body increasingly train in um, quieting, um, then you get more and more kind of used to a sense of the basic idling rate, <laughs> you know, the kind of fertile noise of the nervous system and neural substrates of consciousness just kind of percolating along before representing anything in particular or getting carried away by anything in particular. And it also helps to appreciate underneath it all just innate natural goodness, whatever we call it, innate Buddha nature, a good heart, simple, you know, could take different forms, kind of heartfelt perhaps. For me, it took the form of recognizing, you know, I was a good boy. <laughs> I'm still a good boy. However the form it takes for you. So how about we sit for a minute, simply being with each other, being as ourselves in the present. Thank you very much. <laughs>